Our sermon series that we are starting today is on the Trinity, on one of the core doctrines of our Christian faith, and yet it is also one of the most confusing doctrines of the Christian faith. We believe that God is one, but we also believe that that one God is seen in three persons, creator, savior, perfecter, father, son, and Holy Spirit. But how can three persons be one God? And how can one God be understood as three distinct persons? Can you see how this might get confusing? Especially if you were trying to explain this to someone who hadn't grown up in the church, who hadn't been praying to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for a while. It might be something that trips them up. In fact, this doctrine of the Trinity is one of the few reasons that our brothers and sisters in the Jewish faith really struggle with what we say we believe. For the greatest commandment, the Shema, found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, starts by saying, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is God. The Lord is one. How can God be three if God is one? Can you see where the confusion might set in? Can you see where the misunderstanding might bring or might come out in this? How can God be the creator, the one whom we just heard in the creation poem, but also be the Savior, incarnate in Jesus Christ, and also be the Spirit, the one that hovers over the waters of creation, the one that fills the dead bodies in Ezekiel 37, the one that falls upon the disciples in Acts chapter 2. How can the Lord our God be one, and yet also creator, savior, and perfecter? Honestly, I don't know how to completely explain this. Because I think this is one of those things that is not fully comprehensible. Luckily, though, we do get some hints throughout Scripture that might help us understand this a little bit better than we do now. And one of them comes from the very beginning of the beginning. As we hear in the creation narrative from Genesis 1, that as God speaks, things happen. I love that, and I love the message translation that we, we heard earlier that says, God spoke and said, light, and light was. God said, sky, and the waters separated. God said, swarm, and the fish filled the sea. The birds filled the air. God commands, and things happen. But then there's one part in this creation poem that's not a command of God's. Instead, God speaks, and God isn't giving a command, but he's talking to God. In verse 26 of chapter 1, God says, Let us create humanity in our own image. Now, I'm going to say that again, and I'm going to emphasize the same words that the video that we saw emphasized. Let us create humanity in our own image. God, who up until this point in the poem has been referred to in the singular, speaks to God's self in the plural. In the first person plural of us. So already, before Jesus Christ was ever walking on earth, Already, before we had any language about the Advocate, about the Holy Spirit, before the tongues of fire descended upon the disciples, 
we already had a God that was a little bit more complex than we might realize. For the singular God spoke of God's self in the plural. What gives us another hint is a Hebrew word for God that shows up about 90% of the times that if you look in your Old Testament, you see the word God. And that word in Hebrew is the word Elohim. It literally translates not to God, but to God's, with an S at the end. This word that is so commonly used when we read the word God in our scripture is plural. In fact, this word is found in the Shema, in that greatest commandment. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your gods is God. The Lord is one. Written into the very DNA of the Jewish faith is this idea that God is more than we can understand. That God is more than just one and yet is one. And so we have a God that is complex, a God that is plural, and a God that is still singular. So that's a little bit of the what of the, the what God is as far as how we understand the Trinity, but I think we also need to spend some time asking the how. How can God be both three and one? Well, people have spent millennia trying to come up with a perfect analogy for this. And you know what? Every single one of them fail. There's one that says that God is like an egg. Because, you know, there are three basic parts to an egg. There's the shell, there's the yolk, and then there's the egg white. You can separate them, and they're all separate parts, but together they make a whole egg. The problem with this is that God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Spirit, are not different entities. One is not an eggshell, one is not a yolk, one is not an egg white. They're made of the same substance. They're all God. And so that analogy, while it sounds pretty good and honestly makes me want to go get some brunch, doesn't always hold up as well as it could. But I did find one that even if it does fall short, I really like. And it's the analogy that says that God is like a chord. Yvonne, can you play a C chord for us? God is like a musical chord. Three notes, the tonic, the tonal, and the harmonic. The tonic note is the dominant note. The tonic note is the one that names the chord. And so in what Giovanni just played for us, that's the, the C. Can you play that C for us again? The tonal note, which comes next, is it's three steps up from that C. And so in this case, it's the E, correct? And that E chord, as the tonal note, sets the tone for the chord. It either allows it to be a major, or if you go down a half step, turns it into a minor chord. Can you play that C minor chord for us? adding just a little bit of dissonance into it. And so that second note is so important as it defines the nature of that chord. And then the third note, the harmonic, that G ties everything together. It completes that which is incomplete without it. Now each of these notes can be played separately, right? And we hear them in music all the time as separate notes. And yet, when they are played together, there's this sense that that was how they were meant to be. You can still hear each individual note, but when they work together and they intermingle with each other, something beautiful, something right happens. 
They can function alone, but they're perfect together. That's how the Trinity, and that's how our God works as well. I want to take just a moment and talk about that dominant note, that tonic note of this chord. God the creator, God the parent, God the covenanter. This is the God that we heard first in our psalm reading and then in our Genesis reading, who is the one that speaks and life happens. This is the God that is so magnificent to be entirely unfathomable. The God whose hem of God's robe is so full and so big as to fill the entirety of the temple. The God who brings Isaiah to his knees. The God that is so glorious that Moses cannot see him face to face, but instead must wait until God passes and catch a glimpse of God as God is moving away. This is the God that knows us, that surrounds us, that knit us together in our mother's womb. This is the God that loves us, God that made us in God's own image. Which means, brothers and sisters, that the capacity of this God to create, to do and name things as good, to work in harmony with the Trinity, found within all of us as well. That chord rings true within us just as it does within the Trinity. Now too often it gets distorted in one way or another. But brothers and sisters, it is there. For the God that created the heavens and the earth the universe and everything in it created you, knit you together, and said that you were made in that God's own image. So in the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, may that core ring true within us. Amen.